Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional Indigenous lands that we all live and gather on today. Although this meeting is online and our event takes place at many locations, we each enjoy the privilege of living and working within an Indigenous territory. As a gesture of appreciation for our use of these lands, we ask that you join us in acknowledging the people who have lived and thrived in these regions across the continent for tens of thousands of years. Welcome to DGC Visionaries 2021, where we celebrate DGC filmmakers' work at all the major film festivals across Canada. We're extremely fortunate to have renowned prolific writer and journalist Johanna Schneller as our moderator. Joanna is one of North America's leading freelance journalists specializing in entertainment features. She's profiled some of the most prominent actors and directors of our time, and her cover stories have appeared in every major magazine, including Vanity Fair, InStyle, Premiere, Moore, and Ladies Home Journal. She was a senior writer in the Los Angeles Bureau of GQ magazine from 1990 to 1994, and she's the president of the Toronto Film Critics Association. As co-host of CBC's summer series, The Filmmakers, Schneller interviews directors and film experts about classic Canadian films. She also hosted TVO's renowned film series, Saturday Night at the Movies. Our featured director tonight is award-winning director, Michael McGowan, whose new film, All My Puny Sorrows, is at TIFF and SIF and likely many more festivals this year. Michael wrote, directed, and produced the adaptation of Miriam Taves' uh, international best-selling novel starring Alison Pill, Sarah Gadden, and Mara Winningham. Previously, Michael wrote, directed, and produced multiple award-winning films and TV series, including Still Mine, Score a Hockey Musical, One Week, St. Ralph, and the series he created Between, which was the first Canada Netflix co-production. Welcome, Michael McGowan, and Johanna Schneller. Come on in. <laughs> I like your vibe. Welcome, welcome. We, we have to make it seem as sort of live as we possibly can. So there's the audience for you. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before I turn it over to you guys, I'd just like to point out to the uh, those tuning in, the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen that's where uh, you can type in questions. Joanna will be watching uh, uh, and looking for your questions as they come in. She may not be able to get to all of them, but uh, she will certainly try. Uh, also a reminder that you can choose your screen settings uh, with the view button in the top right hand corner. That's it for me. Really looking forward to this. Over to you guys and uh, see you at the end. Thank you. Hans, you gotta love directors, you know, the Directors Guild putting in an applause for us. I think that's fantastic. Um, so Michael, uh, you and I saw a screening of All My Puny Sorrows together, which was fantastic for me. But I have to wonder <laughs> if you could hear me in the screening, snorting and gasping and laughing and then sobbing when the credits rolled. Uh, actually, the credits began to roll and I had that, uh, that kind of like overwhelming emotion came over me and I was rummaging around in my purse for a Kleenex and all I found was a spare mask. So I ended up blowing my nose into a paper mask and that is my COVID story. But I, I wondered if, you could, <laughs> if I was annoying you by snorting away over there. No, because I told you before the screening that I was not going to eavesdrop on, on your experience of watching it. So, I mean, because we, I was there to do, to check the, the DCP really. So I was sort of making sure there's a final QC that everything was good. So I had purposely put myself far enough away from you that, uh, that I wouldn't be tempted to, to watch your reaction. And I couldn't like it because of the way the seats are at the, at the bell light box. I, I was not interacting with your experience at all. So no. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, good. There were a couple of times there was like a, ha! there was a couple of very sharp little noises I found myself making because the dialogue is so fantastic. But for people who don't know All My Puny Sorrows, the story, the book, or obviously the film, can you just give us a brief synopsis of the, of the arc, the gist? Sure. I mean, it's, it's a book by Miriam Taves, uh, comes out of her 
her lived experience. And it's a about it's a really a, a, a love story between two sisters, one who wants to kill herself and one who want, obviously wants her to live. And it's also the mother and these three women and how they interact in the story of of what's going to happen uh, to Elf, whether she's going to decide to live or not. And uh, yeah. Does that summarize yeah. that, that does justice to very well? Yes. And and the book is a, it is a much sort of bigger span of time. And you, you really distilled the, the script down to um, these conversations between the women, the sister and the mother. And uh, I think you did a brilliant adaptation. What was your pitch to Miriam Tiggs to uh, get her to say yes to you as the writer director? I don't think I, I don't actually think I had to pitch her. I just got in contact with her and told her how much I, I loved the book and that I wanted to do it. And, and I don't, I don't think she, well, I know she didn't ask me to picture how I was going to do it because I was sort of so, so certain it would be easy uh, and that I have no problem doing it, but I really actually didn't have a clue. So I, I, she was gracious enough to let me option the book and I sort of spent a year staring at it, trying to figure it out. And I, and I really did think it would be easy. I thought it would, I can write fairly quickly when I get going. And I just thought it would be easy and it wasn't. And it really stalled for me so much so that the, I think we option, I think option for a year, a year and a half and the option was coming up. And I really had no excuse why I hadn't like shown her, or, like shown her a draft or I just basically stopped communicating with, not like she was asking me or anything like that, but I, I did go very quiet uh, and was just mostly out of embarrassment. <laughs> was it like adaptation, the movie where you just got a little clammy every time you thought about it? Like what, what do you think uh, was the problem and what snapped you out of it? I think the problem, like you said, like it, it sort of, I, I was able to distill it into this condensed time. And there's a lot of flashbacks that we use in the film, but in the book, it, it spans over a longer period of time and I needed to sort of get rid of that. And also, I mean, it's, it's Yoli's story in the book and it's Yoli's story in, in the film, but I kind of needed to figure out what her point, like what her through line was and what was the tension of, for Yoli. And I went out to dinner with Miriam sort of to confess my, my idiocy and and at that dinner, not that she said, or we were really even talking about how I was going to adapt it. Cause she, she like, she was like, good luck. Not, not in a bad way, but she was like, we just went to dinner. And uh, I came up with this idea that Yoli was trying to restore balance in the universe. And once I sort of had that as, as sort of a point of tension, then, then it was easy to figure out the rest of it. And it's always funny when you're writing that something sort of so, I don't know, so simple as that can unlock everything else that you're, you're trying to figure out. And it was, it was, I mean, I went through a bunch of drafts after, but really I kind of had the core of the film that we ended up shooting after that. Wow. Yeah. Um, now, okay. So this is kind of a tricky question, but I feel like it's 2021 and I have to ask you, uh, you are a white middle-aged guy, and this is a book by a woman about three very strong women characters. Um, did you ever for a second question whether you were the person who should be writing and directing this story? I think you do that. I think at least I do go through the rubric of why should I do any project that I'm going to theoretically commit years to. And, and I think that because of Miriam gave me her blessing to to do it was enough of a, an impetus to go forward and to do it. And I do think that, you know, I have daughters, I'm married, there's a lot of women in my life. So it wasn't, I wasn't sort of going to a, a territory that I had no idea about. And I, I really thought that the important thing that interested in me wasn't it was a, 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 a quote unquote woman's story, that it was just a story of three really powerful characters that I was, interested in exploring against a backdrop that I hadn't really considered before. And that, so I, I sort of didn't go, okay, it's a woman's, woman's story and I'm a man. It was like, okay, these are fantastic characters. I think my sensibilities as a writer and as a filmmaker align with that. And, and, and again, and then couple that with Miriam's uh, 
blessing. It felt like, okay, that's, I, I, I'm fine on that. Yeah, I, I, we should tell people who um, haven't had a chance to see the trailer that um, the elder sister, Elfrida or Elf, is a concert pianist, and she's played by Sarah Gadden, and her younger sister is played by Alison Hill, and she's a burgeoning writer, and she fancies herself a bit of a mess. She's a mother. Amy Beth McNulty plays her daughter, and um, Elf and Yoli's mother is played by Mayor Winningham, and they're all just amazing. And I was lucky enough to get a chance to talk to all three of the lead actresses. And they all said the same thing about you, which is that you are such a generous director and that you sort of let them lead when they need to, when they need to ask you questions, when they need to take some time. Um, is that normally your style or was that particular to this film, do you think? No, I think that's normally my style. Like I'm confident enough as a director that I can I can see the shots and I know what we need, but I don't go so, unless it's a really complicated stunt, don't go so far as to shot list, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Because to me, it's like I, when the DP and I sort of look at, or with the art, uh, with the production designer stuff, we sort of look at the space and say, we're gonna be in this general vicinity. And then so much stuff is gonna come out in blocking and questions are gonna arise that if you're sort of trying to sort of tick off a shot list, you're kind of missing the the alchemy or just the magic that happens. And so I didn't really think it was, and I, earlier in my career, I, and I remember doing this scene with James Cromwell, I was not that earlier, Mike, but he wanted to move in a certain way. And I, find, I found myself getting kind of defensive about it. Like, well, I've got this idea. And I'm like, well, just listen to him and then see what he says. And if you think it's, worse idea you should be able to articulate it and if it's a better idea it'll just make you look better and <laughs> really really good actors and they i mean amir allison and, and sarah have done it for so long they understand technically what they're doing as as film actors but they from mostly their questions came out of character and why would my character be here and I find those really interesting questions to explore because they, we weren't just exploring them for a power structure. Like they wanted to sort of assert dominance and I needed to assert dominance. It was really more, it came out of, okay, is this, is this the, does this feel right for the characters? And so I, I don't really look at it as being generous. I just look at it as, as being open to the dialogue and the improvisation that should happen on set because like you'll see like sometimes i'll say okay i think this is gonna like you kind of look through it and go okay i think it's good like you watch the blocking and think okay this is going to be seven shots and then a lens will come up and go oh i i and the operator will just like move something from you know one to another to save you a shot but if i was being really prescriptive i, I would have just got put, put myself in a corner and not let everybody else do do what they do best. And so you're always kind of just watching and massaging, or at least I am, rather than this is how we're going to do it. And it's, it's, it's a way I've always worked. And it seems to, it seems to be a pleasant way for me to shoot. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I, I just like doing it that way. Yeah. And this you shot entirely in COVID. That's right. The whole thing was start to finish shot in COVID. So, um, Talk about what you thought that would do to the filmmaking process and what it ended up doing instead. Well, I was worried that it would slow it down just because of all the protocols, the testing, the masking, the cleaning of the set, everything that we have to go through. But in reality, we had enough infrastructure just because of the number of people you need to hire for that, that it really didn't impact us in, in terms of time, which is fantastic. So we shot this in 20 days with one camera and I mean, it's the shortest I've shot a feature, but we were really kind of dialed. We actually lost, not lost, but we actually condensed the day. We we're going to shoot, we shot it in North Bay. And we we're going to shoot it uh, um, at Nipissing for six days where their COVID cases were rising. We'd scouted this thing and there was set design. It was a real, we'd really gone down quite a, a, a long way on this location. And then they just shut us out. We, we, dry, we did everything we could to try to get it back and we couldn't. But in doing that, it's one of those serendipitous things of film where we sort of parse that out into three different locations and we're able to like we're able to make our days way more efficient because we weren't moving around as much. And so uh, our first AD, Marky and Saray, was like, I think we can lose a day. And 
the DP, uh, Daniel Grant and I were, like Daniel said, yeah, it makes, I mean, Marky knew what he was talking about. And so we were like, okay, if you think so. And it didn't, we just had a really efficient way of working. So, um, so it, 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 it didn't slow us down. And, uh, and also too, I think, because a lot of people hadn't worked a lot. Um, I think we all kind of thought it was a bit sacred to be able to, to make, to make a film during COVID. And, um, and I think there was just that sense of like, there's always for me, at least a sense of like, this could go down any day. Like I was counting down the days way more than I ever had before. Not because the shooting was particularly hard, just because like you said, we lost Nippus thing. We had three false positives during shooting of which I was one. So we had to go down for a day and a half. You just kept thinking like, it's not going to take much for this thing to, and then because we were, we shot in November to December, if we had really gone down where like everybody was going off to different jobs, our leads. So it was going to be really hard to finish it if we did. And um, yeah, like we sort of got to the spot where I go, okay, we're far enough in that I think they're going to have to let us finish this thing. But when, you, when it was day 11 of 20, when I got the, um, the negative COVID test and I, if, or I mean, I've got, I tested the false positive, which was a positive and was really just wondering whether they might just shut the whole thing down for, for a bit. But you also had the experience of, you know, you're in North Bay and the actresses had to quarantine and there wasn't much else to do. Do you feel like it gave you time to rehearse or contemplate the film, the story in a way that we normally don't get on a 20 day shoot or on a, you know, X dollar budget? Do you, was, there, was there any added benefit in terms of the intimacy? I think that there, yeah, I mean, for certainly, this is the first time I rehearsed because Allison was like, we're gonna, we're, she looked at the schedule and said, we're gonna rehearse. And her and Sarah had worked be together before and Allison really drove, Allison and Sarah really drove that. So I had time because I wasn't going anywhere because I was just worried about going, like I was up there for nine, nine or 10 weeks solid because it just wasn't wor worth it to take a risk of going back down and, and maybe getting COVID. So we did a lot more rehearsal and we really refined there's a lot of as you know uh, there's a lot of big sequences that sort of evolve through the film between especially between allison and sarah and they really workshop that in a way that sort of answered a lot of questions like you might have got bogged down for an hour discussing well this or that and sort of as hard as it is to hear your script sometimes before you shoot and sort of as much angst as it causes me, it it really helped uh, us be efficient. So we rehearsed with everybody before we went on set. That's incredibly lucky, I think, for this particular film, because you really did achieve a sense of history among all of those women that was palpable and really important, I think, for the movie. Um, but let's go back for a minute. Um, what, what kind of a kid were you? When did you get interested in film? What were you like? I was probably hyperactive. Uh, I, <laughs> I was like, that's really going back, Johanna. That's a, uh, a one of six kids, uh, you know, uh, grew up in Toronto. And then I ran a lot. I went to school uh, in the States to run. And I always read a lot and stuff like that, but I didn't be, and I, I was a freelance journalist, a carpenter, a teacher, all in my 20s, and really didn't think that. I mean, film wasn't on my radar. I just, I didn't know anybody in film. I didn't, I didn't even aspire to it. I was sort of, I took photographs at a dark room as a kid. So maybe that was maybe some sort of sign that maybe I would do it. But I saw Clerks at the festival, the Kevin Smith film. And I thought, oh, I could maybe do something like that. So I wrote this script just as a, almost as a, as a writing exercise. And a friend of mine uh, read it he was young and was making money on Bay Street. So he said, let's make this. So I drew a little thermostat graph. We had a limited partnership. We had a budget and we were going to have another director do it. And who wasn't really, it, we didn't feel like he could pull it off. And so my friend said, why don't you direct it? I'm like, well, I don't know anything about directing. He said, read a couple of books. So I read a couple of books and, and really that, I mean, that was my dog Vincent. It was, it was definitely like making a student film. Like it, uh, 
it, it was at a time when there wasn't as many films being made because just the, the, the cost of entry was, was more. So we were fortunate to play film festivals. The investors made their money back. Uh, and it was a really good experience for me to just to sort of get on set and learn about it. And then, and then I did a stop motion show called Henry's World with Alliance Atlantis. And at that time I was writing this St. Ralph and so Alliance Atlantis co or, or producers on that, along with the maze. And it was interesting, you know, my dog Vincent was $150,000 all in and, and St. Ralph was over six. And like, it, and you sort of, I was clueless, like on the tech scout, I didn't even know what it was. And, you know, the show up that day and there's a bus with 50 people sort of asking questions that I kind of wish I had a better answers for. but. I, I, you know, I did, I, I, you know, the film was turned out well, and I sort of learned working with professional crews and the pressure of, I mean, we had a lot of big extras days and stuff like that, that, you know, and, and because I had a lot of authority, I think, because I wrote the stuff, I wasn't, I was never trying to, to prove myself as a director when I didn't know anything. Like I was just assuming I was the stupidest person on set. I mean, they have this joke that the only entry level position on set is director. And there's sometimes a lot of truth to that. And I, I embraced it rather than, you know, pretended I didn't know what the hell I was, I pretend I knew that I knew what I was talking about, so. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. So when, at what point did you actually embrace the fact that you're the director and that you have, you do have some skill and some authority? Like how many movies did it take? Well, I, I always had an opinion of what I wanted, right? So I wasn't, I, I was never like, this is the way we're gonna get there. But I, I and that's the thing, I, I always relied on the people that knew more than me to, I could articulate because I had written it, what I was looking for and I also think I had the ability or have the ability, sort of like the nipissing thing, to go, okay, when this doesn't work out, that 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 ship is sailed. I waste no time lamenting that. Like once I know it's dead, like we're not getting nippus thing, I'm like instantly pivoting. And same thing with on being on set in the day, that I, I do think the directors really make their money when the day goes to shit. And when like, cause it, most people can direct a very simple scene and then you try to, and I always started with that. What's the basic, I need, what's, what's the basic stuff I need for a scene and then how can I elevate and how can I make it interesting? And it, I just, the more you do it, the more skills and, and you learn a ton in editing and all that kind of stuff that you, oh, we can do this next time. You see your mistakes, but you all see, okay, this works or we can, this, we can do it this way. So. I never, I mean, you always feel like a fraud in whatever you do, but I didn't, I didn't feel like I, I couldn't see the cuts. And that was always, that always gave me the confidence combined with that I had written it to, to, to sort of be unafraid to ask questions or to go, I don't really understand what the hell anybody's talking about. So can we just slow down and explain it to me? And then you, and of course, as you're on set longer, you just, you, you, you get the language, you get how the set works, and then you, you're you fine. And I think, yeah, so that's kind of the the process of becoming a director, I guess. Um, I, I'm not turning this into your like free shrink session or anything like that, but I can tell you that I've interviewed a lot of directors and not all of them would say they feel like a fraud no matter what they do. I think there's a lot of big egos out there. And I think it's very interesting that you've had so much success approaching this not from a place of ego. You you once said to me that um, your directing style is sort of like being the host of a party and just making sure that everybody's comfortable and that everybody's there to do their best work. Do you think that the, you know, that your um, whatever, imposter syndrome or lack of ego or generosity, however you want to phrase it, do you think that that does make your directing career special or stand out in some way? I don't, I don't know because I'm not on set with a lot of other people, but I do, I think it's idiotic not to use the talents of the people around you. Like to me, it's a no brainer. Like it's like, and you know, I've worked with great people and I've worked with bad people. And so the bad ones you're like, okay, I'm, I don't need, I'm just going to make the, all the decisions here. But 
for the majority of it's been really good people. So if you're in that position and these people are on set all the time and they have, and they get the story and they get what you're trying to do and then they take ownership of it, my life is like way easier. Like I'm sort of then just becoming the traffic cop a bit. And I don't, I don't mean it to sound so reductionist, but it's like, like if I say, to, like if we get jammed in something, we're two hours behind because of whatever, because I, like something I did or because something was some stupid reason that none of us can control. If everybody's invested rather than me, just they're just waiting for me to tell them what to do then we're then all going to figure out how to solve the problem or not. And I, so everybody has to have ego to sort of go, okay, like, you know, to step in that role and you have to, you have to have some, some skills, I think, but again, like, it's just like, you're working with really smart people and you've hired them because you like what they do. So therefore like, and it starts with the actors and it's right down to the, you know, whoever's on, on set, it's like, show me what you can do. I mean, there's, there's always problems that, and it, it hardly ever comes up, but when you, when you get the person that's not that good and you're like the camera operator, you're like, okay, just pan over. So then you're like, okay, they just miss it all the time. So then you're like, okay, well, I could yell at the person, which is going to like, just going to make everybody feel shit. Or I could just simply walk over there and say, I'm going to tap you on the shoulder when I want you to pan because it's not going to work any other way. And then I can go, I don't have to work with this person again, but this is what we got right now. And right. so there's, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're trying, they might be or not or whatever, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't look at it as, I look at they're all trying to help me get what I want. Not as, not as generosity on my part, but yeah, I, I've seen directors that have done it the other way and it just seems like everybody's having a miserable time. Yeah, yeah, uh, fair enough, yeah. Um, I, so you mentioned all the different sort of things that you did before becoming a director. And obviously there's no sort of one way to become a director. So like what parts of your brain do you think, are, are like what are you glad about that you've had those other experiences that you think that you can bring to this, that you, like you know how to do X, Y, or Z, and that that really has helped you. That's a good question. I think that the the carpenter side of me, like, I, so you know the process of how to build a house. It sort of starts with this, 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 and this, and I think it really is analogous to directing. Like, okay, these people need to know this, so on the day we can all be efficient. If you can't like from transport parking the trucks to locations putting the cones if you go if, if you know why they need all that stuff then you won't turn around on the day and go actually i know i said we're going to shoot here but let's just go shoot here because you kind of get what what that involves from a cost point of view and also from a time point of view and i don't have on shows like this the luxury of those things and so it is like it's, I do think it's really important to kind of get what everybody does and how your decisions affect them. And sometimes you make a decision that you know is not the one people want, but you know why you're making it and you're articulating. They might not agree with you. And that's why I mean, that's sort of, that's, I guess, where the ego comes in, but you know you need it and you're going to make it. And if they don't get it, that's okay because at the end of the day, you're going to have to live with it in editing. But if you build the foundation wrong, then you're just going to jam yourself later on. So I do, I, I look at it sort of analogous to that. And then, and there is that craftsmanship of being like, so for example, I knew we were going to go quick on this show, but I don't mean quick, like we're sprinting. I just knew that we were going to make really definite decisions. And the first shot we shot on this, and we had, I think three or we had a, we, I purposely said, let's make the first day a day that the crew would look at and go, we're not going to make it sort of thing. And we thought we would like the, the first day, we all like sort of the inner circle. I wasn't me saying, let's make this and everybody going, no, but, and so the first, the first setup was a wide shot. And I know we're going to use that wide shot for 10 seconds max of a three minute scene. And if the entrance is fine and the exit's fine, you can cut in and out of it anytime you want. And the entrance was fine, the exit was fine. And so we did one take of that. And I said, okay, moving on, let's go in for the close-up. And I could, 
I could tell in that moment that people go, okay, he said he's going to do this and he's now doing it. And, and again, like on the coverage, of course, we're going to take multiple takes. We're going to explore things. But if you kind of know what you need out of that, and if there's something wrong with that master, we would have done another take, no problem. It wasn't like we're just going to do one because that was the mandate, but it sort of says be on your toes and be ready to go. Cause we're not, we're going to get what we need and then go on. We're not going to try to find it through like once we finish the blocking and find all that stuff, once we have our game plan, then we're going on and we're moving on. Mm -hmm. I also think everybody just relaxes then. It's like when somebody gets up to make a speech at a wedding and their first couple lines are funny, you feel like everybody's shoulders come down, like, okay, I'm in good hands. I can relax a little bit. I think if you're, if you're confident enough to keep it moving like that, then people know that you know what you're looking for, which I think is very reassuring. Right. And, that, and that's the thing about you can spend time on the blocking, like figure out those. Don't be afraid to spend the blocking going, OK, well, this doesn't work. Let's take 10 minutes to to make everybody happy here. But once that once we go, OK, now we know the five shots we need. I'm just listening for nuances of performance, not worrying about anything else. You know, there's this theory that if you look at somebody's filmography, you can see a biography, that you can see sort of what they were interested in at any given time. Um, and your output is so varied. I mean, you've done a story about an elderly couple fighting to build their home. You've done a hockey musical. <laughs> you did a, you know, motorcycle road movie, um, you, you know, 14 year old long distance runner in St. Ralph and stuff. Um, your tastes are hard to pin down. So do you think that helps you or hurts you as a director? And do you think there were biographical elements in all of those stories that you were interested in now at those times in your life? Sure. I mean, if you look at, like, I mean, uh, still mine is a true story, but the guy who was a carpenter and built his house. I was a runner. I went to a Catholic high school. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't, it was, you know, that's a biographical element. I was a teacher wrestling with existential crisis and you know and so that of one week uh i played hockey as a kid so i do think that there's and there's elements of of me in every one of them but i i sort of look at that as my tastes are eclectic like i don't i wouldn't want to repeat myself and sort of just okay here's he does this one kind of thing it's like whatever the story is and whatever you can find in what you think is an entry point. And also I think, like I said, if you're gonna spend years doing it and you gotta believe that it has a chance for greatness. And, I, and if it doesn't, that's fine or it's not fine. But I think every project I've set out to do, I inherently believe that it could be great. And that, that's, you know, and there's certainly lots of times, I and mean, as I was saying about the script, that you just feel like a failure or watching the assembly. And I, you know, watching the assembly, the editors will say, like, I just basically need therapy after it because it's just like, you just feel like you're just totally shit. And no matter how much I tell myself, there's a reason we have three more months of editing, like, you just leave completely. I've never left an assembly going, I'm actually good at this. And then you slowly sort of chisel away at it until you think, okay, well, it might not be terrible anymore. And then it sort of, and then you see, you know, how far along the, the road it, it can get to be maybe good. Wow. See, you are a modest director. You really are. Um, it's, you, we, we talked a little bit in the past about your ability to sort of find things on the fly. And you mentioned, you know, like pulling over on the Trans Canada Highway to sort of shoot something with Joshua Jackson in one week. Um, can you talk, tell us just a couple of problems that you had to solve and how you solved them? Do you remember any off the top of your head? Well, it's, it's always the sort of, well, I mean, in St. Ralph, I remember that this this big running scene at night where he was going to he's had this sort of this workout that was going to define whether he could possibly have a chance to win to win boston it was going to be around a track and for some reason <clears throat> i think it was a lighting issue we just really couldn't figure out a good location and a good way to do it in the time and we really wrestled with it for a while and the production designer said why don't you just make it over trails and so that geography didn't actually really matter and that was one <clears throat> again where 
shooting over trails made it way more visually interesting than around a track would have been. Uh, and then like even on, which we, nobody's seen except you and uh, me, all my puny sorrows, there's a scene at the end that was in front of a house and it would have been quite static. And, you know, I'm just, I was going for a run in North Bay. I was like, oh, these train tracks, they're so much more visually interesting. And it, and again, I think if you're just sort of, everything is an input when, especially when you're shooting or when you're writing and I'm always looking to up it and, and, and see, oh, is that better? Are we doing the best we can? And almost like constantly turning it over to go, yeah, this would be a better location. And then, you know, and then there's stuff like, because we're shooting in 20 days, we had a unit move for a half a day that was, you know, and it was going to take a, it's going to waste three hours. And then, so you sort of combine locations. That's kind of the usual stuff that you sort of just have to, you have to figure out the puzzle and the, and hopefully the most elegant way possible on a, on a scene by scene basis, but also on a production level. And I, and I like that aspect of it where you're, you're always trying to think of like, just, yeah, you're always surprised by like losing Nipissing ended up being like trains are a big theme in all my puny sorrows and where the psych ward was, the backdrop is this train track. It's so much better than what we would have had uh, at Nipissing. I wouldn't have missed it because I wouldn't have known I missed it, but you kind of look at that and go, oh my God, that's fantastic. That was a little gift. And you have to sort of be open to receiving those little gifts. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously you've worked a lot, you've done a lot of different things, but every director has downtime and times when projects crash. Um, I don't know if there's any that you can talk about, like a special loss that it was hard to get over or, or just in general, like what do you do during your downtime? How do you handle it? How do you keep the faith that you're going to have another project? Well, I actually look at everyone sort of like my last one. Like I, I do, I, <laughs> I don't go, okay, I'm guaranteed another shot at this with any directing job. But fortunately, because I write, I can go and write and just try to figure out different worlds that isn't reliant on being on set. So that's kind of my saving grace. I don't know what I would do if, if I didn't have the writing. Um, and because it's uh, like, it, it doesn't really give you any control, but it gives you this semblance of control. Like if I can write my way into another project, I can work again. I mean, I, I do episodic sometimes, but that's sort of the, be, like, you know, being the instigator of my own projects has been sort of the, I feel fortunate to be able to do that. And so yeah, I, I'm trying to, I'm racking my brain here. Every feature you've made, you also wrote, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and it, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, do you think you ever would direct someone else's feature? I mean, I hear what you say about episodic TV, but. Absolutely. Like it, it's, I haven't read a script that I think, okay, I would be the right fit for. Um, but yeah, like it, nothing would make me happier because the writing is so damn hard. It's like, oh, wow, it's already there. Great. I, I can, I can go do this. Uh, so you know, there's, and when I go direct episodic, I'm, I'm just the director, which is such a, I'm not wearing any other hats. I'm not wearing the producer hat. It's so nice just to be on the, you know, go in somebody else's world and try to figure out, you know, how that works and, and just concentrate on one thing. Yeah. Um, so you did the series. Yes. Um, did you approach that differently as a directing challenge? What, what made you want to do the series between, uh, um, I think this, and again, it's sort of, I mean, the independent film world, who knows how long, where it's going, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you sort of just, I always just try to game out what I could possibly get made that interests me. That's always sort of looking at it. And I thought, okay, well, there's a chance for this. And the thing that's nice about series, like we did two seasons of it, is that you're working, like you're working with more writers. It's way more collaborative. And, and I mean, obviously making the film and post and all that is really collaborative, but it's nice being on something more than just 20 days on set. And so, and, and I think it, I mean, it's not an original thought, but prestige television, it, there, it's really becoming the, the new indie film or has become the new indie film. And I do think that that's sort of a better place to work as if you're lucky enough to do that. Um, 
did you have a different kind level of money for between? Did that make a difference to you? It wasn't, I mean, the reality is you never have enough money. <laughs> like, uh, like it was fine and it was, it was great, but you're always, I think that the budget always sort of goes to whatever money you have. And I think like if we had twice the budget for this film, it, the, you know, we would have paid the stars more. The unit would have got bigger. The, it, it, there would have been more people involved. And you and I were talking earlier, and I, I look at trying to do films on a smaller budget, not with an asterisk, but just as a different viewer experience than a $200 million film. So there shouldn't be an asterisk. It should just be a different viewing experience. And I've always felt like, Fortunately, we've had enough money for all the films. Like I, I, like it's, you're making choices, but I never thought the choices, like the wrong choices were made because we had a lack of money. It's just because of my own idiocy, but it wasn't, it wasn't like you kind of work on the box. Like for example, one week, it was originally like, you know, St. Ralph, I think it was around 6 million. And, the, and at that point you think, okay, my next film has to be 8 million or, or something like that. And, and I had done, a pilot for CBC that I thought was going to go to series and it, and it, and it wasn't. And then I realized I've got nothing to do. I, maybe I can make one week way cheaper than I thought I could. And I think that really helped us because we were so free to really just go like there was no footprint. So if you want to shoot in a hotel room, you rent a hotel room. If you like, we shot the, the, these scenes with horses that we we pulled into Medicine Hat on a Friday, needing horses, a view, all this stuff. We had none of it. And somebody at this motel we were staying and said, oh, I know these people that run this farm. They would talk to them. We'd go down. They say, oh, everybody gets engaged in this one place. Our horses are really calm. And so we just shot the scene. Like, <laughs> But if you're doing it on a bigger budget, it would be horseback riding lessons. It would be a stunt coordinator. It would be, you'd fly out there three times. Like, you could shoot that that scene for the whole budget of the movie uh and i don't think the scene suffered from it and and so that's kind of that's the approach i've always taken to to doing things just making sure that the the box that you're working with makes sense for the film but also makes sense for the trying to tell the story trying to tell the story properly yeah yeah, we had an interesting conversation because I, like, you know, as a non-director, obviously, I always think it's kind of interesting to find out what a budget is, especially for a Canadian movie, because I am very proud, I'm very chuffed that we can make something that looks so great and you don't need $100 million and that there's, there's all these movies that have fallen through the cracks because everything's gotten enormous. And, and, and like, you know, to me, like the reminder of the tiny can be precious also, um, you know, I'm like, let's say what our budgets are, but you had a really good argument for sort of not saying what the budget is, um, which is sort of like, you don't want to change people's expectations of what they're going to get or something. Can you, can you just remind me of what well, your answer is? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, if you see a, a film like Moonlight or you see a film like Once, like there's there's these tiny films that really almost were made for for less than even we had but there's such a truth and an honesty to them that I, and i don't think the filmmakers say hey watch this film with an asterisk they're saying this is it and i love those films and i loved watching them and i didn't think oh if they had 20 more million dollars like the untouchables the french film i thought was much better than than the adaptation because the adaptation sort of it lost something whether it was the money or not it sort of lost something in translation literally but it, it did it it did become less as a remake and you know or um uh what's the what's the quebec films with that vince vaughn made the remake star uh starburst i want to say starburst but it's not anyway the the friend it, Sorry. It was great. It was great as a, as a, a little French film and and sort of felt untruthful as as the, as the film starring Vince Vaughn. So there is an ability and a freedom. Like and I think it's what I was saying to you. Like I have, as a writer, director, producer, I have probably too much freedom 
to make choices, but there's a shorthand, and this is going back to working with people that that I that I trust and I think that are really talented. Is like go execute this. Like once we've made the decision, we don't have enough money or enough time to do to do it four times. Just know that this is the way we're going to do it. Unless there's some kind of problem, that you have to 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 redo it for whatever reason we didn't anticipate. But in doing so we don't have to second guess anybody like hopefully they're not second guessing me the crew and i'm not second guessing them and we're just like good go and and you know our production designer worked on guillermo del toro's film um and you know like the decisions we were making i mean and her that was a very she wasn't a production designer but that was a very stressful job of what all the stuff that she had to do on that but the major decisions that we were making were far like it was like this is the speed we have to go and there's something terrifying about it but there's also something like okay let's let's just get it done yeah yeah so you think if you tell people what the budget is that they it will somehow color their expectations of what they're going to see or what they're going to get and you would rather not pollute that yeah i just think it's it's irrelevant to the film going experience like if it's if it's 25 million or it's 2 million or I mean, people know it's not a hundred million dollar film, but it's like, we, we were so lucky with casting. We were so lucky that we got to shoot it. We were so lucky with locations that we don't need, I don't need the, the film is just the film now. It doesn't, it's almost like a novel. You wouldn't say, well, how long did it take you to write it? If it took you 10 years, is it going to be a better novel than if it took somebody six weeks to write it? Not necessarily. It's just, I, I, I think the film should stand for, for, for what it is, not for what it costs. Because I'm not, I'm not saying we, I'm, I don't, and I don't believe this with any of the films, that we needed more money because we figured out a production model that worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you brought up casting and this film is so just exquisitely cast. I, I can't imagine anybody else. Um, but as a director, do you have battles for casting the person you want versus maybe who the money people want or who the market wants you to want? Like, how do you prevail as a director and get getting the cast that you want? I think casting is always a dangerous road because there, the international component component wants or the American component, but you don't really have, especially when you're making films through telefilm, you don't have the American component usually locked in before you make it, but there's always a danger of getting the shiny thing rather than the thing that works for the film. And certainly for this, because it took so long to make and we have so many iterations and we went down a lot of different casting routes and, and trying to like number one or two in the call sheet had to be Canadian and how to how to make it all work, whether we were going to do a co-pro or not, was really complicated. And we looked at everybody and we talked to tons of people and there was a ton of interest uh, from a lot of actors. But, and then it just, you just got to get lucky <laughs> because then you're like, okay, because we're really late in the game. Like, I think it was, we didn't really get the green light till I want to say beginning of October of 2020 or maybe even the middle of it. And we were shooting a month later. I think I might be wrong in that time. But so you're all, and you can't make offers to people like, just like, okay, but you don't have the financing. So if you don't know, it's always this cat and mouse thing. So we had a really good, a great casting director, Heidi Levitt, who was really good at Nav and she's out of LA, was really good at navigating uh, that for us. And, you know, some, but, the it is funny thinking of all the iterations and then going thank god we ended up with this because it could have easily like can, i mean i don't have the luxury of saying okay i wrote it for <laughs> this person uh you know you certainly certainly actors i've worked with you could and i've worked with you know worked with them you know numerous times some of them that you can bring them back but you couldn't go but but i do think that the it does drive the international in a way that's probably, in this case, it was fine, but it could be dangerous for sure. So how do you stand up for the casting that you want? Like, how do you, what's, I mean, the, what's the formula that you say, like, I have to, you have to trust me or? Well, eventually the train leaves the station. <laughs> we've got, we've got, 
like, like I don't mean it like you you can have the best actors in the role and if the film is shit, it doesn't make any difference. And I think that the fact that the international in this film component of the financing was small enough that it really, they couldn't really say much. They, they might not make any money off it, but they weren't gonna lose a lot. So, it, and they were fine. It wasn't, there was no issue with them going over our dead body and me saying this, but that's, so that's what I'm saying. If in a much bigger, like there was people that were suggested that were quote unquote bigger names, that was like no way, like it's not going to work. So, and you know, you so there wasn't a fight about that. There wasn't like I just wouldn't have made the movie. Huh. Wow. So because what I love about this, I mean, as a person who's you know avidly watched Canadian films since I moved here, um, you know, I just love how it feels like the culmination of so much stuff that's been in the works, you know, like Sarah Gadden and Alison went to Claude Watson together. Like they went to junior high together. They're the product of the sort of Toronto public arts school education. And, and then they, you know, they hit the world and they, and they, um, you know, learn their craft and, and like your crew and the fact that it's a Canadian novel, like it just feels so much like the, the, the industry has grown toward this moment. And it's so nice to see it happen, that, 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 that there is this very Canadian story and you shot it in North Bay with Canadian stars and you kept, and you were able to pull that off, you know? Um, does that feel like an accomplishment to you? I am proud of the fact that both Sarah and Allison are Canadian. Like, I love that. And I and I think if it didn't happen, it would be fine. Like, it wouldn't be like, okay, this is, is terrible. But I don't wanna wave the Canadian flag too much. And I don't mean it like, when we had this conversation when trying to figure out how Canadian we should make it or not, and decided, you know, make it, call it Toronto. Call it like, like, don't run, like, don't run away from Canada. Talk about like, mentioned Pierre, there's a bunch of references in there, as you know, but other people don't, that, that deal with a Canadian, like that are unabashedly Canadian, but I didn't want to hit people over the head with maple syrup, if, if you know what I mean. And I do think, and I, that, and I, and I think those, I try to do this all my films, like the particular reveals the universal. And I'm hoping that like any great story it doesn't feel canadian to people it just feel like audiences outside of canada will embrace it for just a good story like and i think that like some a film like Madi did such a good job of portraying the east coast but it was such sort of a universal struggle that made that film work yes and i think that is true of this as well it doesn't it doesn't matter to the story necessarily that it's Canadian, but it, 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 it just felt to me like, I don't know, I was just so happy to see it all come together in this way that I thought was really beautiful and, 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 and all sort of leading like so much, I feel like so many years of work and so much, you know, stuff that Canada has been working toward has been progressing to be able to make something like this. I just thought it was really beautifully pulled together. Um, you told me that you go through a kind of yo-yo process with each and every film, you know, oh, this is pretty good. Oh, no, my God, it's shite. Oh, now it's ready. Oh, no, now it's shite again. And is, is that you being hard on yourself? Or do you think that there is actually some use for you in that process of, I love it, I hate it, it's good, it's bad? I think it's actually good, but it's nothing, it's not, it's not something I can really control. It's not like I'm, I wish I didn't. I like I, I don't like I don't judge it when I'm filming at all. Like once like once I finish the script, I no longer think of myself as the writer. Like I'm just like okay, how are we going to make this in the best way as the director? I'm not precious about it. And when we edit, it doesn't matter to me if like I'll kill my babies if it's not serving the story. Like I, like I'm ruthless that way. Um, but I don't. There's there's just always that. You know, you've got good reviews, you've got shit reviews, you've, you know, been celebrated, you've been hammered. Like, it, I think anybody that does it long enough, if you're fortunate to do it long enough, you're going to, you know, the slings and arrows and also the accolades are all, you know, are all kind of part of it. So 
if you, I wish I was better at just sort of accepting the, the compliments as well as sort of living with the negative. And I think that's, I don't, I, there's nothing I like, I, I think, cause that's not the way I sort of live the rest of my life. And so whether it makes me better or not, or makes me a, a basket case sometimes that way, I don't really know, but it's kind of just the process of, of doing it. And I remember when I first started writing, like I took this creative writing course in university and I wrote this 500 word story about these two people, they fall in love, they go out of love and the relationship ends. And I thought it was just pure genius. <laughs> it's like, it was so bad. Uh, I wish I could have a little bit more of that confidence with less of the sort of blind hubris uh, of it. But I do think that the being critical on every stage really does probably make it better. Like even when we're mixing uh, and you kind of think the film's done, like we were messing around with the voiceover, we were taking out dialogue and you think like we've looked at this film for, you know, months and it's like, what happens if we do this? And so, and it's better, like, I think it's better, but you're always, if you're always sort of attuned to this could still be better or this is not, not, I don't feel like it's shit at that point, but like, why, why isn't the scene working or why isn't it giving me the feeling that I need to, to get? And you sort of trust that disquiet. It allows you to, to figure out, oh, like it's something as simple and maybe nobody else will notice it, but the people in the room notice it. It's like, okay, the cue's coming in too early because it's directing it rather than just sort of underscoring it. And we, we had this one cue in, 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 in that, in one of the scenes. And I think everybody's kind of used to living with it. And then like, this is like, I don't know, the 10th day of the mix or something like that. What happens if, and the composer was there and Lou and Jane, the, uh, you know, and all the tatter, Tattersall, Sim, whatever they're called now, uh, were all there and we are like, we sort of then started discussing it and everybody sort of chimed in to, oh, we can do this, this, and this. And we, through collectively working on it, we got it where we all thought, oh, that was worth the hour we spent sort of fucking around on a little piece of it because we, because it just tweaked it nicely. It's this much better. It's yeah, exactly. And that's, yeah. And then you sort of have to go, okay, well, it's, it's, th then you're comfortable letting it go, but like, you know, st you know, Tiff is in a couple of weeks. I don't know. <laughs> will we get our heads handed to her, or handed to us, or will it be, you know, a, a nice walk in the park? Yeah. Uh, all right. I have a couple more questions for you, but first we're going to take some questions from people who are watching. Hello, people who are watching. Um, uh, this person does not have their name on it, but uh, the question is, this is a style of movie that used to be the foundation of the indie genre, a two or three hander. The business, the business has changed so much. Do you care how or where people watch your films in theater or streaming service? I mean, well, we're dealing with COVID now too. Uh, I mean, I would like them all to watch it in a the theater, but we haven't really watched films in a the theater for two years. so. I mean, I can have a great viewing experience at home and I think lots of people can, but in an ideal world, for sure. Uh, in a, I mean, I wanted you to see it in a theater just because it, I thought it would be a better experience. Yeah, I'm actually really glad I saw it in a theater because I love the overwhelm, the overwhelm that you get with the big screen. And and I, it's the first film I'd seen in a theater in a long time and I realized how much I missed it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I urge all of you to go and, uh, see it in the theater if you can. And so another question, also anonymous. As a filmmaker, you've really leaned into emotion so successfully with St. Ralph and One Week. Um, was this a movie, All My Puny Sorrows, that you leaned into the emotion or did you want to restrain that? Because it's already such an emotional piece. You can maybe answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again? <laughs> you, could, you could answer that question. Uh, I mean, uh, this... I lean into the emotion for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I don't, I think that in trying to, if you're trying to sort of say, okay, this is going to be emotional at this moment at like 78 minutes, we're all going to be crying or whatever. It's not really, it's not the way I try to construct things and, and people react to different part. Like people are emotional about different things in my film, but I do think that what Miriam 
did in the book of combining like, you know, sadness and despair with this incredible sense of humor is something I've done before. And that's sort of what attracted me to it. So I think this is probably my most emotional film, really. Like I just, it's, but, it, but I don't think I leaned into it or didn't lean into it. Um, and also this sort of the serendipity, not the serendipity, but sort of allowing actors or crew or anybody to do what they want. There's a scene where Allison is in the parking lot. And again, I've seen this, but basically she went to a place that was not in the script and she leaned into it. And at first I was like, is that right? Or is that not? And we, she wouldn't, we didn't, hadn't discussed that. And then you, you kind of realize, oh, okay, that totally makes sense. And that's not something as an emotional moment that I thought would go there. And that's kind of the interesting thing about how it evolves. Yeah, letting an actor do their thing when they yeah. really know. Um, uh, Astra Burka asks, with climate action on our radar, do you include sustainable solutions in directing or making the film greener? Well, I think we shot it in 20 days, so that was pretty green. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we're always, I, I think this, you know, I mean, I think the waste that we had on set with, with just like water bottles, like I think most crew now are, are carrying, you know, reusable water bottles, biodegradable uh, lunch stuff. So yeah, I mean, I'm, it drives me crazy when I see, you know, I won't name the department, but I think we all know the trucks idling all the time and stuff like that. So I, you'd have to look at it with that in mind as, as we evolve as an industry and we're contributing you know, we, we should be contributors to making the, the, the planet greener for sure. Yeah. Um, Richard Berlin asks, given the short turnaround you described from when you got the green light to when you began shooting, just that one month period, how did you handle your pre-production and um, how much of a difference did it make to your comfort level that you were the writer? So at least you knew the story inside out. Yeah, no, it made a huge difference that way. But then again, you just, I think like in this case, our Mark and the first AD really takes the brunt of it because it, he's trying to make the board work for production. And then, um, and then obviously working with the, like the DP, the art department, like all the, like, you know, locations, everything else. So as long as you have good people, you're, everybody's sort of all like, you know, you're going to start in a certain day. So, like, and you might feel like you only have the first two really set, but that's, that's, I'm comfortable enough living with that uncertainty that, that the infrastructure is there, that the problems will be solved. Not, not naively, but like, like I said, when we not, when we lost Nipissing, I was like, okay, well, let's just reduce it to what we need. Really. We're looking for three rooms. Let's not, and of course we got, we ended up getting much more, but it, that's, that's sort of the process of just trying to be comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, one of an anonymous question um, wants to know about your writing process. So do you start with theme, character, plot? Is it different for every movie? Do you always have an outline? Yeah, no, it's different for every movie because uh, this one was the book. Uh, I usually try to start just writing and sometimes I'll get stuck and I'll realize that the that I've gone down, like the, either the screenplay is never going to work or I'm fatally fucked at some point and I've got it like for example in one week I like I was uh, the first act would have ended with him finding out he has cancer and the doc and then leaving on the road trip but every time I tried to write that it felt like we had one movie for the first third and then we we're gonna have another movie for the other two thirds and so and I kind of wrote along that and I couldn't unwrite through it and then when I moved you've got cancer right to the beginning of the film and then the the, the narrative pull was will he come back get treatment? It made everything work. And, and then still mine, because it was a true story. I went out to New Brunswick. I interviewed um, the characters there and, and sort of then I probably had a, a pretty general idea of how the screenplay would work. Uh, sort of where I, where I knew where I'd finish because spoiler alert, he built the house. Uh, so I kind of knew in that one where we'd end up. Um, and I, and I, I knew, I knew where uh, one week would end up as well. So yeah, I, I, but I don't really, I don't do like a 20 page outline because I just find it, 
I do it a bit more for the television stuff, but not for the film stuff. Huh. And it just wastes your time. You know where you're going. No, I don't know where I'm going. And I think that's, it makes, I think that's more interesting to me. And it drives me crazy because I don't know where I'm going. I get stuck, but I feel like it's not so prescriptive if I, if I don't have it all. I mean, like, listen, if I could figure out, okay, here's an, whatever, however many pages, here's what the film is going to be. I would write it down very quickly and at least use it or not use it. But usually I'm just trying to find my way through it, through the writing. Have you ever had that experience of, oh my God, it's writing itself or it's telling me or I didn't know it was going this way, but here it is? Yeah, you, you definitely, there are times where you're simply, and I, that's probably the most, in all my PD stories, probably the most autobiographical, like when you're, I think I wrote, when you're in the zone, you feel like you're a productive member of society. And there's been scenes that I've written that I think, how can I, how did I ever not, and I don't mean to sound like, okay, these are so great, but for me that like, where did they come from and why can't I access this now? And like I said, like I wrote the last, like I wrote the last 90% of one week in, in, in literally a week because I was desperate to work again. And, uh, and after being stuck on it for a long time. And so, yeah, I do find that I'm stuck, 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 really not enjoying myself or anything about the writing process. And then if I get unstuck, I, I tend to go pretty quickly. And so with the script or with the film itself, I think this question applies to both. Um, at what point do you know that it's as good as it can be? Is it like an emotional feeling, an intellectual feeling, a combination of both? No, it's not that at all. It's like, I'm sick of this and I'm gonna get people <laughs> to read it. Like, like, I think it's sort of like, I, okay, I barfed it out, I refined it. Like you can't, I don't know, like I, I never know. And then you, and then you'll like, I'll like give it to my wife and say, what do you think? And then I'll sort of then give it to a few more people. But, and I really do want to, and they'll tell me if it's not working. Like I'm not looking for like, it's great. And then you then sort of hand off to the real people and you get your head handed to you. And so, and I write screenplays for, people that aren't in the film industry to read. Like I, I write them as like, I just you could as a document that you could read and understand because I think it's more important than any kind of a technical document. Um, but then, and then sort of like, and then you think like, like somebody will say, well, this is the best thing that you've written. And then you go, maybe it is, but I don't feel like that. Like I don't finish it and go, oh my God, this is great. I feel like it's like, okay, I'm, I'm either going to put this away for the rest of my life or whatever. Let's just see what people say. Huh. Okay, I'm going to ask you two more questions um, so everybody can settle in for the last two questions. Um, what are you really proud that you've been able to put out on screen, either with this film or, or some of your other films, like an idea, a scene, a moment? Is there anything that really stands out where you think, well, I'm really glad I added that to the pile of art in the world. Like, I'm, I'm glad I had that. It sort of goes back to that earlier thing that of the duality of the positive and the negative. Like, I've had people say really intimate things about how my films have changed their lives. And, and I've been really generous that way. And so you think, okay, sort of accept that for the praise that it is. And I've had people <laughs> basically say, this is a piece of shit, the same film. And so I don't sort of look at, it's almost more forward looking. Like I don't, I don't go back, I don't look and go, oh my God, this was so great. It's almost like the story behind getting it was good. Or I do look at some of the things I've written and go, I don't know where that came from. And I don't know whether I can do it again but I don't want to sort of go, okay, well, here's how I'm, here's the four things that I think are great or not great. And I also think that the line, the line between success and failure is fairly arbitrary. And I, I could see how just like my dog, Vincent went to the Atlantic Film Festival. I met somebody from Alliance that was in the kids department. I did Henry's World because I took a, a van ride with her. And then they did <clears throat> St. Ralph. 
there had to be a few dominoes that worked out. And maybe I would have pivoted some other way, or maybe I would have been doing something else entirely. And so you're always trying to put your, at least me, I'm trying to put myself in a position to succeed or to raise the bar or try to, as I said, try to do something great. But you also need to get lucky in so many ways. Like this film, I really feel was 49% not going, 51% going. Like I just, I, and, and if you, I don't, I don't, so I look at all that stuff as I've been lucky enough to be able to do it. But, and I think that if, if they turn out some of the stuff, you know, and I, if you'd ask me when I started, would you have this level of success? Would you take it? Of course, I would have said, yeah, in a second, but you're always trying to then trying to do something, trying to raise the bar again. And so I don't go, oh my God, that's a scene that everybody should, not everybody should, that's a scene that, but there are, you know, there's certainly scenes that I, that I think are better than others for sure. See, you are a modest dude. I, I would say that there's, and people will see when they see this movie, those scenes between, there's, there's a couple of pivotal conversations, long, maybe there were five pages, you said, five page conversation scenes between Allison and Sarah that are just breathtaking. And when you're an old man, like when we have <laughs> point, you're gonna look back at those scenes and think, God, they really were, they really did, they were magical. Um, um, and so my last question to you is this, obviously you give a lot to your films, years of writing, financing, putting it together, you know, weeks in the editing room. This one was what, six years? All my beauty sorrows all in? I think so. I think we're now coming to six years, probably since I should actually, I, yeah, I think it's six years since I first optioned it to, to now. Yeah. So that's a lot. That's a lot to give to a film. So what do you think your films, your work gives to you? Well, and again, it, it's sort of like, I think the filmmaking, I think filmmaking is process, like writing is process, making the film is process, editing is process, post is, it, it's all process. And I think, it, again, it sort of goes back to building the house, you or you built the house and been lucky enough to build it and hopefully it's a good house. And there's, and again, there's this whole, it's because it's interesting. We're on the verge of Toronto and, and, you know, there's a lot of expectation for this film. There's a lot of, there's a lot of goodwill behind it. And you just hope that that win in the sale, this film will sort of, you know, mixing metaphors, like make it stand out against the crowd or whatever. It's just, it's, and, but I do, you know, anybody that like sets out to quote unquote be an artist, if you can make a living at it and you can be so fortunate as to to do it, then I think you'd be an idiot not to feel somewhat grateful. And you know, I feel extremely grateful that somehow I threaded the needle uh, as the person, you know, we were, th my wife and I were, th you know, 33 years old, two kids in a one bedroom apartment and 40 grand in debt, like we were fucked. Like off the outside on the limb of trying and, and just thinking, I don't know. I don't know if this is ever going to work. And I, and I, so I, I don't think I, that doesn't feel that far away. And so to be able to have a career, if it all ended today, I'd be like, okay, I had a good run. I hope it doesn't, but you, you, I don't look at it and go, uh, I deserve more, I should get more, but you, again, hopefully I, I can figure out a way to put myself in a position to do it again. Well, uh, I, I have seen this film and I can guarantee that you will be making other films because this film is so gorgeous and I'm so, so happy that we had a chance to talk about it. I think Hans is gonna come back on to say goodbye, but I just, I'm, I, I love talking to you. I love how, modest you are about it but but i just want to be able to say publicly that um i'm so so glad you made this movie and it's such a beautiful movie thanks and, so much. Uh, thank you for talking to us about oh, all of it that was easy <laughs> <laughs> right, thank well thank you both very much uh michael congrats on on the beautiful film uh and all the best on the festival run and eventually the release 
Uh, I hope all that goes as well as it really should with such a beautiful film. And, and Johanna, thank you so much for leading this wonderful conversation between the two of you. That was really fantastic. There, there are lots of things in there that we should put on t-shirts uh, for the film industry to wear, lots of great nuggets of knowledge. So thank you so very much for that. And, and to everybody tuning in, uh, as Johanna says, go see this movie when you get a chance, either at the various festivals or when it's released. Um, coming up next uh, uh, for us at DGC Visionaries, September 3rd, uh, we have directors Shasha Nakai and Rich Williamson talking about their new film that's going to be at TIFF and other festivals called Scarborough. And that's going to be moderated by Jenny Punter from Variety Magazine. You'll get invitations uh, to that coming soon. So join us for that. Another great conversation. Uh, Michael, Johanna, everybody tuning in, uh, be well. Thank you so very much for tonight and have a good night. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. -bye.